Okay, so we're in this uh, series of messages that just started last week, so you haven't missed a lot. It's, uh, uh, what does it mean for us to be kingdom people? Not just church folk, but, uh, or individual followers of Jesus, but, but uh, participants in the kingdom of God. And uh, um, we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount for the next several weeks, and uh, today we're going to be looking at the second part of the Beatitudes. So let me read to you. When uh, Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside, and he sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they'll inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're going to pause there, let me pray with us, and uh, we'll jump in. Lord, uh, we pray that you would teach us from your word, and uh, we admit that we come with all kinds of uh, attitudes and beliefs and practices, and we pray that we could lay them all down at your feet and hear you speak into our lives. That's our need today, that's our prayer, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, last week we looked at the first uh, four of these Beatitudes because those are about um, our needs, our basically our neediness, our brokenness, our, our poverty, um, our passivity, our heartbrokenness, and God's blessing is, is on us, not just us though, but and not just Christians, but it's it's on everyone who's in this situation. God's blessing is on them. But nobody has any control or planning or action to take um, uh, nothing, nothing you can do to make yourself poor in spirit or heartbroken. It's usually what happens to us or the situation we're in um, or, or our, our place in life. Jesus changes though, it's a subtle change, but in the ones we're gonna look at now, the second part of this, these are all actions. These are all things that we're responsible to do. So the other ones had to do with what, where we were in life. These have to do with what we can do in our life. See the difference there? And so today we're gonna to be looking at, at the, the actions. And uh, blessed are uh, the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called children of God. That's what we're going to focus on today. Now, there's an old um, Portuguese saying that says, if I die, I forgive you. And if I live, we'll see. <laughs> and I think there's some wisdom in that because, you know, when we forgive, we're releasing people. You know, we, we, there's freedom in that. But if we're gonna live, we don't really wanna release them. We don't want them to know freedom. And so we'd rather hang on to this for a little bit longer. And, uh, and the, the, the dilemma with that is, as we um, hold people, basically, uh, with our lack of uh, forgiveness, mercy, how we treat them. We hold them captive, but we also turn ourselves into captives. <clears throat> and so uh, the, this Beatitudes have to do with how can we begin to experience uh, the wholeness of life and the life that God intends for us and is, that's his gift to us so that we're not bound up and uh, slaves to our own um, attitudes and, and uh, behaviors towards people and towards ourselves, really. Um, so um, looking at this, this very first one, um, mercy. Uh, mercy is one of the great uh, words in the Bible. It's interesting that Jesus brings this out. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. This is the only one that the payoff is exactly the same as the action. Isn't that weird? If you, you know, because of God's great mercy to, to you and to me and his love for us and his care for us and the forgiveness that we know and the freedom we have, because of all of that, we can then turn around and treat people with mercy. 
and, and, and give that to them as a gift. And the reward of that is, the result of that is what? We receive more mercy. So in, in effect, it's this giant si uh, circle in which mercy is flowing and flowing and flowing without stop. That's the picture of this, of this beatitude. And, and throughout scripture, oh man, the, the word mercy, we've talked about this in here. I've even had you guys pronounce it poorly, yeah, the Hebrew word for mercy. Remember that? You all remember it, right? No, you don't. <laughs> you liars! You liars! <laughs> yeah, 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 I remember it. Okay, here's what it is. Chesed. <laughs> you don't even have a chance, you know. I, <laughs> I trained you in this. You got it so good. And you people at home, <laughs> I expect you to pronounce this too. Chesed. Chesed. Now you don't clear your throat and then say the word. It's all one. <laughs> Chesed. 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 Yeah, you don't go. Hesed. <laughs> Anyway, okay, just, just playing with you here. But that word of, of God's tender mercies, his attitude towards us, his behavior towards us, the way he uh, includes us in his love, uh, that is throughout scripture, profound. And now Jesus says, since you've received this, this is what you need to do in your life. Treat people with mercy. Treat people with, with this tenderness and with uh, the compassion and, and with demonstrable love, really. Find ways to treat people with that. Um, you know, it's not easy. In fact, uh, um, one of the things that, that Jesus went on to say in his parables, he gave example after example of people who received mercy and then refused to give it. I guess the guy who was uh, forgiven a million dollars and then he's walking away feeling good and, and he runs into a friend who owes him 20 bucks and he starts strangling him, beating the stew out of him, you know. And all, and Jesus goes, what's up? That's not a quote really, but, but you get the message. And, and, and the idea is if you've been given this great mercy, don't hold it and go, aren't I good? I got the mercy. It, it's to be our, our first course of action with people. The first option is mercy. Now, I was thinking about this. There's a, um, there's a tendency when we hate somebody or a group of people, like, like, uh, it's always safe to talk about World War II because nobody's alive yet. So from there, so um, you remember in uh, World War II, uh, Germans, um, of which I'm one, um, uh, my dad joined the Navy because he didn't want to join the Army and fight Germans because they were family. <laughs> so that's a side thing, edit out of the <laughs> video. But um, so uh, they hated Jews. And because they hated Jews, they were cruel, cruel and mean and uh, abusive. But the more they were mean and cruel to the Jews, the more they hated them. We always hate what we're cruel to. And so they hated them more. So then the cruelty, uh, went, and then I thought about this. I thought this, this happens so much in our lives. When we can identify somebody we hate, we can't stand, then we can, it gives us an excuse to be cruel, but the more cruel we are, the more the hatred grows. You know, we've heard candidates talking about, you know, getting our uh, neighbor, international neighbors to put up, we're gonna put, build a wall, but make them pay for it. You know, I love that. We're gonna make them pay for it. But the Canadians aren't gonna be able to pay for a wall all the way across. That's, that's unreasonable for us to expect that. But, Maybe we can get Vancouver to build the wall. <laughs> now I'm just playing with you. Um, but you know what happens? This happens inside of us. <clears throat> Something happens in us and we know it and we hate that about ourselves. 
And so we start acting in hateful ways to ourselves and in hurtful ways and in ways of self-destruction. And, and, and we're undermining the very life that we want to have and we're, we're cutting off our options. And then the more we do that, the more we hate ourselves. And so instead of a circle of receiving mercy, giving mercy, receiving more mercy, instead of that, we have the hatred, undermining hatred, abuse, hatred, abuse, that circle. What we receive from God, we need to extend to others. We need to show mercy and receive mercy. The full circle, that's the only circle that's, that can obliterate the other one. And I spent my life, uh, people coming to counseling who, who have such obvious self-destructive behaviors, and you go, holy mackerel, cut it out. You, know, you want to say, you know, but I'm a pastor, so I say, well, let me pray with you. <laughs> wow, why are you doing that, you know? And then as we explore it, Something happened that made them feel that they weren't worth anything, and so they started. And then it grew, and then it grew, and then it grew, and now they can't even see the cause and effect of it. But God can, and so his, his, his attitude towards us is loving kindness. And he says, and that's what you give to people. Stop the hate abuse cycle. Then he says, God blesses the pure in heart, for they'll see God. They'll, they'll understand that they'll know who God is. The pure in heart. Now, purity in, in Scripture is uh, um, clearness, the word is. It's an interesting word, clear. Um, so purity of heart, uh, that you're, you're clear at the center. You're, you're clear all the way through. You're not at all cloudy, or you have a, a put on a mask for one situation, or you pretend a persona over here, but then you have this other reality going on inside. You don't have this uh, outside and in. You're the same person all the way around. And uh, I, th I think I told this, I had an associate pastor, a youth minister, who was in some ways really great. And, and uh, he came to me because he had a problem. He said, you know, when you're talking with people, you know, they, they really like that, that they think you care for them and stuff. And he said, nobody ever thinks I care. They think I'm indifferent to them. Could you teach me how to communicate so people thought I cared? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? And so I said, uh, do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> but if you could teach me how to communicate so people think I do, that would be wonderful because as a pastor you want people to think you care. I'm a what an idiot. Imbecile. <laughs> He didn't want to be clear all the way through. I, so I told him, you know, you are a fabulous communicator, one of the best ever, because in your heart you don't care, and they know it. You've, you've communicated it clearly. Mission accomplished. You got it. He went away sad. But you know, the thing is, what does it mean for us to be uh, pure of heart? We're not pretending, we're not putting on stuff, we're not acting one way with some people and differently with others. We're, we're the same all the way through. There's a, there's a purity. God blesses that. And you know what? When, when we have that kind of authenticity, we have that kind of honesty, um, we know who we are and we show who we are and it's the same. And uh, what's the payoff of that? We see God. We understand who God is. Really. We understand that God's loving, kind, merciful, forgiving. It's impossible to be a, a Christian, a true believer, and think of God as angry. Because it just means you don't know God. 
You have no idea, you're clueless as to who God is. I think that Martin Luther who said that. It's a good, good quote. I don't know if he said clueless, but it was right in there. <laughs> Whoever believes yet regards God as angry is not seeing God correctly. It's not just me, it's Martin Luther too. You can throw that in. And, but I, I mean, that's another situation. I mean, you know people like this. Maybe you are one where uh, you, things have happened in your life and you just seem to almost not be able to get over the fact that God's this angry cop who's pulling you over and going to wreck your life. So we, we act a certain way and we try and make it look a certain way on the outside so that so that we don't get the anger that we think is coming. The problem is we don't know God. We don't have any idea who God is unless we can sense God's tender mercy towards us as the foundation. I start to live that out. Then we're free to be the same inside and out. No barriers, no walls. Then it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called children of God. Now, once again, I'm kind of upset that God didn't let me write the Bible because I would have done it a little differently. I think Jesus should have said, and I'm a child of way back, you know, <laughs> hippie times. So, um, I think he should have said, blessed are the peace lovers or blessed are the peaceful people. Wouldn't that be nice? Blessed are those who have found inner peace. Wouldn't that have been good? Jesus could have used any of those three ideas of mine. <laughs> Instead, he goes and says, peacemakers. Now, uh, growing up, we, my dad had in his, in his dresser drawer a Colt 45 pistol, like the cowboy movies. I thought those were so cool, but he wouldn't let us play, you know, play with it. But um, a Colt 45. Now, you know what the name of the Colt 45 was when it was sold? It was the Peacemaker, not the Widowmaker. <laughs> Although it may have done that. <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> it was called the Peacemaker. Isn't that interesting? This was the Peacemaker. At the turn of the century, you know, Eileen's an Irish citizen, so I know the history of how the Irish saved civilization. The turn of the century, virtually every policeman in Boston was Irish. Why? Because they were such peaceful people, you know. <laughs> lucky, lucky charms. <laughs> no, that's not it. That's not, why. that's not why. It's because they were the toughest, meanest, hardest fighting people in town. They'd have a little adult beverage and then pow, 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 pow. That's who you want to be sheriff. <laughs> right? The peacemaker. The one who's not afraid to get in the middle of the problem, get in the middle of the controversy, say, let's straighten this out. You know, don't make me stop this car. You know? <laughs> That's a whole nother thing, you know, but uh, parents have been saying that one time. See, we got all messed up when we started thinking about, wouldn't it be great if our life was kind of peaceful? Wouldn't that be great? That's why suburbs were invented. <laughs> Actually, that's why over in Bellevue, they have guard gate communities, you know. Um, can't get in to mess them up, you know. So you have this peacefulness. Everything's quiet. If you really want to know quiet, drive down the street here to the end. Down the end is about two blocks down. <laughs> The graveyard. <laughs> that is really peaceful. Spooky, but, but peaceful. See, that's not what Jesus is talking about. He doesn't say, blessed are the peaceful people. It's the ones who go in assertively into the conflict, into the difficulty, into the brokenness, into the dis-ease. 
And here's the, the biblical word for peace, the, besides shalom, which y'all got, but in the, in the New Testament, it's resetting broken bones. That's what peace is. Resetting broken bones. So you go into the brokenness of life around us and we, and, and we reset. This is assertive. This is, you have to do stuff here. Yet you reset the broken bones so that God's healing can take place. That's what peacemaking is. It's not running away and trying to get away from everything so you can be quiet. It's running towards issues and running towards brokenness and running towards disease and saying, let's, let's set this so that it can heal. Let's set it so it can heal. And so these people are going to be called children of God. These are God's children. Because they're doing what God wants to do in our lives anyway. What he wants to do in our situations. So, we offer mercy. We offer you know, tender mercy, compassion, kindness. We experience clearness all the way through, purity. And we move towards people and towards life and towards situations in a way that healing can happen. Resetting the brokenness. Um, now this happens, uh, you know, Jesus said, my peace I give to you. And he said, don't, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let your, and don't be afraid, okay? Don't have anxiety and fear. That, my peace. So there's a, at some point deep inside of us, right? Deep inside where there might be anxiety or fear, Jesus moves in and resets the brokenness so that healing can happen and gives you peace, deep inner peace, right? But then calls us to be peacemakers out there. So it's a very intimate, personal, inner experience that gets translated into a broad, wide action that we do. As we move out, we don't have to look far to find brokenness. But where we find it, we reset the bones. Now, So I came up with three words. You know, pastors always have to have three words. You know, I don't know why that is. Uh, <laughs> I try and get away from it, but you always come back to it. Three words, and they all start with the letter C. Okay, you know, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm not. <laughs> it's. I think it's a. I think it's a genetic thing. You know, God says you're going to be a pastor, and then He gives your brain, you know, everything comes out in three letters. <laughs> okay, so the first one is, if we're going to be acting this way, the first one is that it's going to require us to challenge. That's the first word, challenge. It means that we don't just accept what's going on, we don't accept the world the way it is, we don't accept the brokenness the way it is, we don't accept the phoniness and the artificiality. We don't accept that in ourselves, in the world around us, we don't accept meanness and the hate cycle. And so we challenge it. Say, there's another way that I'm going to live. I'm not going to buy into it. And so we challenge people, situations, you can challenge governments, you can challenge anything. Challenge the church. <laughs> start with it, start with me. And, uh, not right now, but <laughs> in a day or so. <laughs> but, um, but, but challenge it. Don't just accept. Second word, change. We have to change. God wants us to change. He wants us to be agents of change. He wants our world to change. And you cannot grow without change. I wish we could. You know, I've had this uh, my whole life in churches. They, they'll hire me because they want to grow. And then we get there and I say, okay, let's do some changes. And they go, hell no. 
<laughs> what, do you, what do you mean change? You know, we just want to grow the same. You know, we want more people just like us. And you know? oh, we don't want to change. You know, I go well. Then you don't get growth without the change. I remember years ago, I can say it because it's years ago, things are funnier with time. <laughs> so uh, I got this call from Hollywood Presbyterian Church. Uh, their pastor had gone off to be chaplain of the Senate, and they wanted to talk to me about coming there as the pastor. And I said, uh, no, 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 no. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> it wouldn't end well, you know. And uh, they said, no, 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 we think you're really great, you know, because we've seen what you've done in these things. And, and uh I said, okay, let's just take something here. You know, you're ready to do a new thing. We want to do you know, all these things. Okay, let's talk about worship style. It was a big cathedral church, you know, in Oregon. And uh, I said, you can't be the church for the city, like your new motto is. The church for the city. And do what you do. You could be the church for the Northern European uh, 17th century city. <laughs> be good for that. <laughs> they were starting to realize I probably wasn't the right one. <laughs> but this is what they said. It was really cool. They said, you know, we'll change in every way except worship music because our sanctuary is built for a certain kind of music and anything else won't sound right in that sanctuary. I said, wow. You gotta go get another pastor. <laughs> you know, this isn't gonna work. But the funny thing is, this idea of we can grow without changing. Now you all have to change, but I don't. Isn't that great? I spend my life telling you all to change, and then I can just kind of stay the same. But no, there's no personal growth, there's no growth in the church, there's no growth in our life without change. That's the second C. Third C, real quick here. Choose. We, we, when we feel futile and wound down, we think there are no choices. There's always a choice. And the choice is for wholeness. The choice is for life. Choose it. We don't have to treat ourselves the way we've treated ourselves up until now. We don't have to treat the people around us the way we've treated them up until now. Choose a different one. Okay, so those are my three C's. I'll recite them again. Challenge, change, and choose. Okay. Then we'll be God's children. Okay, I'm going to put a parenthesis on this. We'll move forward through the fall. But um, thank you for your um, choosing to be a part of uh, what God's doing here. Really appreciate it. Let's pray, Lord. Thank you for your tender mercy that will not let us go. And thank you for the healing that comes when the bones get, brokenness gets reset. And thank you that we can be pure by your grace. It's all you. So bless us in Jesus' name.